Welcome to our final webinar in our 2024 Women in Leadership Executive Speaker Series, with this one specifically focused on women leaders in what I've termed women-focused organizations, organizations that really are focused on helping and lifting women um, as at least one of their primary purposes. I'm Dr. Susan Madsen, founding director of the Utah Women in Leadership Project, and I'm also the Karen Haid Huntsman Endowed Professor of Leadership in the John M. Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University, and I'm the host and will be the panel moderator today. And as most of you that have joined know this already, but this event furthers the mission of the Utah Women in Leadership Project, which is to strengthen the impact of Utah girls and women. And we serve Utah and its residents by first, producing relevant, trustworthy, applicable research. Second, creating and gathering valuable resources. And third, convening trainings and events like this that inform, inspire, and ignite growth and change for all Utahns. And I'd like to thank our sponsors, as always, the Utah Education Network, which is UEN, the John M. Huntsman School of Business, and USU Extension. So I want to jump in right and, and introduce our guests. So first, I want to introduce Samira Harnish, and she is the founder and executive director of Women of the World. Women of the World is a women refugee, asylum seeker, and immigrant service and capacity building nonprofit that has been in operation in Salt Lake City since 2010. So 14 years, I did not, I knew it was at least 10 years, Samira, but 14. Uh, Samira founded Women of the World to fulfill a lifelong dream of helping women achieve self-sufficiency. And her leadership has enabled uh, per many participants um, to become preeminent women's refugee service organization. Her organization has become that in the state of Utah. And she has received local, national, and international recognition for her service leadership. In 2018, she was awarded the America's Region, uh, is it Nansen Award from the United Nations High Commission on Refugees in Geneva, Switzerland. I hope you were able to go to Switzerland for that. I did. I love Switzerland. Yeah. And she was also chosen from, well, for that one, she was chosen from over 450 international nominees. In April of 2019, she was awarded the American Cross, Red Cross Hero for Extraordinary Heroic Act, Act of Global Citizenship. And then recently in December of 2023, she received uh, the award of Inspirational Advocate for Human Rights from Salt Lake City Human Rights Commission and the Salt Lake City Mayor's Office. Welcome so much. I'm so pleased that you're here with us today, Samara. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Well, after that introduction, I think I'm going to pause before I go to Liz and ask you the first question. So we have a little break between my uh, bios. So Samira, let's get started by having you actually, be, before I go into my first question, I just want you to take a minute or two and give a little more background about Women of the World. So tell me a little bit more about Women of the World. Sure. Uh, so Women of the World is uh, just like you said, the mission, you know, our we help uh, forcibly displaced women of, um, from all uh, the world to achieve their self-reliance, economic success and avoid in, in communities. So it started uh, from my um, car, uh, the Honda Pilot, for seven mm -hmm. years, going around uh, Salt Lake City and helping women from all over the world and men as well. Uh, the first time when I came into Utah, I was uh, 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 like a medical interpreter for, uh, to work as a volunteer for resettlement agency. And that's when I heard a lot of women talking about, we need someone to be a leader for us to give mm. us a voice and show us the resources. So um, last year we helped 1500 women and every year, of course, close to 1,000. Uh, uh, just, uh, I will say a lot of people, they said how many languages they speak. I said um, 35 languages. Uh, so that means from all over the world, you know, they, uh, 
um, and I know how much you want me to speak about yeah. women of the world. I think that's a good, yeah, good really, start. Yeah. 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 Thank you for giving us that background. Liz, I would love to get introduce you. So Liz Owens is the CEO of YWCA Utah. And she's also what she terms in her bio, a womanist, feminist, multiracial, most multicultural woman of color from Utah. I love that. She serves as a community educator, just gender justice and racial justice activist. Her multi-issue work is firmly rooted within human rights and social justice framework with the focus on the intersections of power and privilege. She has experience working with women on issues that disproportionately impact women, specifically with historically underrepresented individuals and communities, including women of color, transgender folks and their loved ones, refugees and immigrants, queer youth, and women involved in the criminal justice system, gangs and or drugs, uh, drug trafficking, sex work and prostitution, and survivors of domestic violence and sexual violence, among many others. As the CEO of uh, YWCA Utah, she leads the organization in meeting their mission of, and their mission is eliminating racism, empowering women, and promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. And she has a bachelor's degree in sociology from Utah Valley University and a master's degree in human rights from the University of Essex. Is that how you say that? In the UK. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's correct. awesome. I got it right. And so I would love to have you take a couple of minutes and introduce the YWCA. I know people have heard of the YWCA, but uh, you just recently in the last two or three months, and I've been at the YWCA many, many times, but you gave me a formal tour to see the whole campus. And it was much bigger and, and inclusive in terms of what you do than I was even knowing from my many years of, of being collaborating and partnering. So tell us a little bit more. Yeah, well, thank you. And thank you for having me here. So YWCA Utah is 118 years this year in Utah. Um, we're part of a larger national and global organization, um, but we are our own standalone uh, agency. We have in 1977, we opened uh, the first women's shelter in the state. And currently that's really the main source of our programming is family violence services. So we run an emergency shelter with 242 licensed beds, 48 suites for families and for singles who are experiencing violence um, or, at, or are at risk of um, high lethality and need to to access safety. We have a transitional housing complex with 36 units of two and three bedroom apartments for single parents and their dependent children. We also host the Family Justice Center, which is a collaborative center with the DA, SLPD, Unified, um, DWS, a lot of community partners that provides a one-stop shop for folks in our community who are experiencing family violence to walk in and access services in one place. And the hope is that that minimizes the the time, the amount of times that they they may need to share their story, and it also increases access to, uh, you know, a bevy of services in the community that they may need access to. Um, and then we also have an early education center, a nationally accredited early education center that serves from six weeks through to full day kindergarten. We serve the community and uh, youth on our campus in that in that early education center. And then we all have um, some race and gender equity programming, which is largely focused internally, really holding all of our direct service programs accountable to our mission of eliminating racism and empowering women. And we ask ourselves, how, what does it look like to do that within our staff structure, within the way that we engage with each other and within the way that we provide services? Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that reminder for me, but I'm sure that educated everybody. Thank you for both of your amazing organizations. So this is this webinar today is more about you. Um, and so I wanted to frame those organizations because they become part of our identity, don't they? I mean, my Utah Women in Leadership Project. But now I'm really excited to hear about, uh, just give us a little background from each of you. Samara, I'll go over to you about your career path and how you ended up where you're at today. And you started giving just a little bit, but tell us a little bit more. 
Sure. Yeah. So I'm. Uh, I came from uh, Baghdad, Iraq, in 1979. To um, I was uh, uh, a range manager in my team and sent to Logan, Utah, to study engineering. Oh. And uh, so I came from a uh, family. They're all educated. They have postdoctorate in 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 math and chemist biochemistry and physics, dentists and all these things. So. For me, I was like cell came from high school. I didn't, so that's why um, they um, decide to come, you know, to send me with this uh, new person in my life to meet and to come to Logan, Utah. And that year, Big I, change. yes, and 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 that year actually I had my first child, and I took my child with me to go to college. And because I cannot afford babysitter uh, as a foreign international student, we pay more than two times the tuition than American. So, and unfortunately that year in 1979, if any anybody remember that, the American hostages were in Iran and everyone thought I'm Iranian. So I was pushed from hospital, from college, from um, stores everywhere. Go home, Iranian, we do not want to serve you. But that, of course, it did not stop me to go to school and take my degree, engineering degree and work in one of the largest semiconductor for 20 years. And at that time, you know, one, one of this reason, of course, that uh, I always think one day I'm going to help women uh, always is in my in my mind and in my uh, focus. Uh, so I remember, you know, in 2009 and 2008, I heard uh, Utah, they're bringing a lot of refugee in here. And there were like 60,000 refugee in 2009 when I came in. And I resigned from being an engineer to come and focus on those women. So I started to be a medical uh, interpreter as, as a volunteer for a resettlement agency. And when I saw, I thought only Iraqi women I'm going to help because always I had in my heart that how come, I'd, you know, I wasn't with my family when mm -hmm. they went through all this war, oppression and sanction. So it was a guilt inside me. And mm -hmm. I now is the time I wanted to help those women and men and children from there. But from there, I listened to the women that are coming from Africa, that they speak Arabic, but different, uh, different dialect. Um, that they wanted someone to lead them, to be uh, their voice, uh, to give them the resources. So I start to learn my resources in Utah with them, actually. They are in my car going around to know about all these things. So um, uh, I, I started Women of the World. Is one, this is one of many reasons. Um, yeah. I love that. I love Thank that. You know, we're so driven by our hearts as women who want to be engaged in, you know, our head, hearts and hands. Right. Um, exactly. So Liz would love to hear your background and how your career path and then how how you're where you are today. So I um, I grew up in Provo. I'm a first generation college student and I benefited from a lot of social support services like food stamps, as it was called back then, it's now TANF, Section 8 housing, free school lunch, um, and went to college on a Pell Grant and work study. I went to UVU, as you said in my bio, and studied sociology. And my big dream was to get a bachelor's. I just, I was, again, first generation college student. I just, that was where, where I was, that my I was on that ball. And I thought after I got a bachelor's that I'd get a good job and that that would be a huge accomplishment. And it took me a long time. I'm actually a very late bloomer. It took me uh, seven years of college. I was working and trying to just survive while going to college. But while I was studying, I had a couple of professors who just kept pushing me to think about grad school, which was completely out of the scope of my imagination. I didn't know anybody who'd gone to grad school. It just was not a thing that people did that I knew um, and it wasn't anything I'd ever considered, but they kept pushing and pushing and prodding and encouraging. And so I started to peek a little bit about what it could be, what I, what I might study, you know, what I might be interested in. 
And I fell down that rabbit hole and um, and eventually decided to go to grad school with their support. And as you said, I went to I ended up going to England because I was really moved and inspired by injustice. I think there mm -hmm. are experiences in my own life, but also learning about other people's lives and stories. I was always very touched by them and moved by them. So I knew that I was just going to follow that feeling. And so I wanted to study human rights. And at mm -hmm. that time, it was like 2005, 2006, there weren't human rights programs in the mm -hmm. U.S. And I'd never considered leaving the country, but um, but I did. Went to the mm -hmm. University of Essex and studied international human rights. My focus was really at the intersection of race and gender. There's a, there's a personal experience there that really led my interest. Um, and then I ended up getting an internship there with a women's rights organization called the Fawcett Society. And I worked on a campaign called Seeing Double, which is the intersection of race and gender. I, um, I also um, was a research fellow at the London School of Economics where I researched women of color leaving state custody, so jail or prison, and resettling in, in London and Southeast England. And um, worked as an advocate in prisons for women with an organization called Women in Prison. So I stayed there for about five years, just really steeped in the community there, working um, with women and in women's organizations under a larger framework of human rights. And then I came back to Utah in about 2012 and continued with that. And so I've worked for a number of nonprofits here around gender. Um, that include the Utah Pride Center, Planned Parenthood, the Utah Domestic Violence Against um, the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition, Utah Coalition, um, Utah Coalition Against Sexual Assault, I UCASA. <laughs> UCASA, um, and, we we know all the acronyms. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So a lot of women's organizations. So I've been in the community, and I really started as an advocate. I mean, I was volunteering when I was nineteen in a in a domestic violence shelter in in Utah County, and. Um, and then I was a coordinator and then I was a, you know, a director and I just moved up. And so eventually, 20 years into my career, the, the role of um, CEO came up. I love the mission of the organization. And I felt quite honestly, I felt like I had some critiques about how I felt like the organization could do better. And I had some ideas and I wanted to try to be a part of creating um uh, a better organization. I mean, it's a great organization and it has been amazing. I, I thought I, I had something to offer and to contribute into sort of the next chapter of the organization. And uh, so I decided to go for it and didn't really, I don't know, I didn't really imagine I had a chance. I just had a newborn like two months previously. I remember. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. And I felt like it was a big leap and um I think just having a newborn and having done that big wild thing of having a baby, I went into every interview and I was like, listen, bring it, bring it. I just had, a, I just brought life into the world. So, um, so I entered with a kind of confidence that I may not have had otherwise. And I was successful. Um, and it sounds like maybe you had in your mind, what can I lose? I mean, I might as yeah. well go for it. Did you have what, what is typically really um, common with women is that they have a couple of people that have stepped forward just to encourage them. Did you have that as well? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And that I mean, gives there, you some there confidence. were women. What's that? That gives you some confidence, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. And it helps you reflect and ask, reflect on yourself. And, um, and, and in the end, you know, there were women that I was texting right before I walk into the interview. I mean, I think I've always had circles of women who have made every step of the way. And even currently, really like surrounded me with love and support. And um, as you talked about the resilience that, that, you know, there's, there's some inner resilience that I think we all need, but having a community around you to, to kind of catch you when you're, when you're falling is um, so critical. I love that. Thank you for that introduction. I'll start moving a bit, a bit quicker now that we've gotten some, some of the background done. I'm going to jump to a unique question. I think I've only asked it one other time in this series, but I I um, think it's really important for all of us to consider. And that is, I am sure with both of you that there has been something to cause that you've been afraid of, like for any reason, these are big efforts. So if you have been afraid for any reason of any topic, how did you move forward from that? How did you just keep 
keep uh, making progress. Samira, let's start with you. I won't start with you for every question, but no. one more question and then I'll go to Liz first. Okay, yeah. Well, I mean, of course, yeah, I was very afraid of uh, when I was, the, I was the one female engineer between many male engineer and you just don't believe it how much I study days and night before I go in the morning at seven o'clock in the morning to meet with them. Uh, that was really scary for me because I'm the breadwinner for my five kids mm -hmm. and I need to read device physics about the, uh, how do we um, shrink that microchip because we in the, in the process to shrink the phone and the TV and everything. So that was my module and I need to be in there uh, ready when they ask me a question I'm not gonna think about it or saying you know just like I said you know as a woman and color and engineer in there always we are now good with the science and everything so I wanted to prove them wrong you know all the time so I was afraid if I'm not gonna answer that question or something like that that will the company will lose million dollars, you know, for microchip and all these things. So that's one uh, one one of the things that um, um, uh, I was setting extra yeah. time to do that. And of course, you know, with women of the world, the first time when I sat women of the world, I again, you know, I don't know anything about the nonprofit or whatever. I came in from all the civil engineer, electrical engineer, you know, working with the semiconductor and all these things. So when I came in. As uh, uh, in the women of the world, I have to take classes. It's different languages, you know, yes. different languages. I was <laughs> talking about abbreviation. And my kids, they used to say, oh, my mom, she's alien. We don't understand what she is talking about at that time. But I have to learn a new language, a new vocabulary. How do I become a leader? How do I become a good uh, person with the, those women? They're asking me to be a leader, but I, how do I You're do outside of your comfort zone. Like this whole it, thing is outside of your comfort zone because exactly. it's new. Exactly, exactly. And I was really frustrated. I need to learn. I need to, you know, go to the UNA, see about the workshop, do this and that, you know, just to learn. And people that were really amazing, amazing people that against me, that they say, okay, you're, you're going to fail. How long are you going to stay with your... Oh, really? Yeah. Seriously, you know, and we have enough, uh, um, we have enough uh, homeless people, we don't want more homeless people, and I don't know where do I go and talk, you know, because, uh, and, and when you're going to give up, you're still in your car, you don't have an office, so this is what make me so mad and oh. upset and make me so strong, I am going to keep up and going, and I am going to do that, but I'm afraid of failure because of the way, yeah. I didn't have money to hire someone to help me to turn on my service. You just started with you in a car, basically. Exactly. And, and people telling you that it sounds like what they were saying, though, is working from a place of fear, which we still see that of if you start something, maybe we'll get more people moving that we don't want in Utah. But you you knew better than that. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm really not sure really still, you know, because many organization around maybe they thought I'm here taking their position, their money, oh, I see. Uh, their grant or something like that. I mean, I know nothing about the grant and people like I did six figure and, you know, in my life, you know, so now I'm in here, I have to beg. You know, for this thing, you know, it does feel so, like begging sometimes. Yeah, so I mean, it was it it was really I was very afraid from I'm gonna fail with this woman the the women that are around me they wanted that help they want to yeah. they have that confidence in me I'm gonna do something for them and here I am I'm looking for someone to heal me to find them a job to literally I was in the car with so them many yeah office. yeah so thank you for that many different, in, including our own, like, do we have what it takes as people and then having other people question, but you, I love that it made you mad. Sometimes it just yeah. makes you mad. And that's what d helps us keep, especially when we're feeling it, that we need to do yeah. these things. Uh, yeah. Same question to you, Liz. So actually I'm, um, 
I, I'm afraid all the time. I think oh. whenever my my staff are introducing me or they say like, oh, here's Liz, our fearless leader. I'm like, not fearless. Oh. I, um, I'm full of fear all the time, I think. But there are two things I do. I feel the fear and I do it anyway. And I also try to move through the fear and work through it to, to get to bravery, like reground myself and my why till I feel brave again. But I feel fearful all the time. I think in general, because the work is so important and there's so many lives that are touched by it and so many futures, not only our residents, but our staff. So I definitely feel fear um, often. And it's just uh, something that I constantly have to work through. Um, but in terms of physical safety um, or physical fear, I have also um, unfortunately experienced that. We are a domestic mm -hmm. violence shelter and we are a public location. And so we do, um, not only is it residents, partners who choose to use harm, but also just from the community, we've experienced a lot of mm -hmm. um, security incidences, but there are also things that happen when, when families are in crisis. Sometimes it's detoxing, sometimes it's overdosing, sometimes it's suicidal ideation um, or attempts. And so I'm, I'm afraid for the experience of those people, as well as the experience of my staff who are supporting them. I, um, so there is a lot of fear. Carrying some, both of you are carrying a, a weight on your shoulders <laughs> um, to, yeah. to love and care for, for people that are in your spaces. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel the fear all the time. I feel fear all the time. And I don't, I don't, it doesn't hold me back. I work through it. Like I said, I reground and try to get to bravery because I know I can, but it it's always there. Well, thank you so much, Liz. I'm going to start start um, giving you different questions now. And then for those listening in, in about five minutes, I'll start pulling some questions from the chat or the Q&A. So you're welcome to start asking some questions over there. But Liz, I've had to be careful about this question and not asked it to many of the people I've interviewed, but you're the one I can, I okay. can bring this bring up. <laughs> and so, um, what do you think are the most challenging power structures? You've studied power structures in your work, but specifically in Utah. And how can women, including women of color, um, navigate those power structures? So a good academic kind of question, but, but it impacts our everything we do in yeah. this state. Yeah. That's a big that, question. It, it's a great question. And what I'll say is this, the power structures are incredibly complex because they do intersect with each other to create unique experiences, oftentimes unique barriers and unique, for some people, pathways to opportunity. And for other people, as I said, barriers to opportunity. And so sometimes when we look at, um, when we try to, and we often do this, I think it's, we all do this. We try to look at one power structure. We might look at True. the legislature, for example, or Congress or, or um, social services and public funding. But in fact, they're all really intertwined. And yeah, and we have to take a few step backs to see the way in which they are intertwined. Because when you only look at one, this happens with bills all the time, but when you only look at a slice, you sometimes can't see the other mm -hmm. effects it has. But when it intersects with others, it has other compounding effects oftentimes. So Power structures, I mean, I think you you can look at any level, you can look within an organization and see the way in which, um, whether it's the leadership team and the board and um, funders and donors and other stakeholders, they all of their um, motivations um, and expectations will intersect to create the organization. And, and that can sometimes be great. And oftentimes we have to really be able to see all of those forces and the way that they impact the decisions that we're making uh, to serve folks better because sometimes th there are consequences to choices that we make because of those power structures that we can't really see. So it's, it really is about, um, it's what I would say is always more complicated if you, yeah. and, and, and power structures don't exist in isolation. And if I could say, you know, what are some of the um, largest power structures that impact women patriarchy. I mean, and how do you entangle that? And how do you entangle its deep embeddedness in our, in, our, um, in our lives and in our community? If you were to do that, just alone, look at that, you'd see it threaded in so many different places. And all of the places in which that thread goes through are impacted by all the other places. So the, the what you experience at home then impacts 
in public, what you experience in public will impact you in home. And so, um, and I we see it in our race and gender equity work, of course, I think sometimes it feels easier to see it there, but it definitely is there in, in domestic violence work as well. When you think about how prevalent violence against women is in our world, it, there isn't just one. Stage. Right, right. But there are power structures like laws that don't protect people as well as they should, right? Yeah. Um, and laws um, around domestic violence are relatively new. They pretty much started in the 70s. So um, there are so many power structures that impact someone coming seeking shelter. If they don't have housing, they may not have access to education, they may not speak the language, they may be a refugee or immigrant, yeah. and all of those intersect to create an individual experience. So I don't um, want to be a downer because I am actually totally <laughs> optimistic, but we do have to, we have to take a deep breath and look at the complexity. Yeah. And sometimes we just dive into one issue and, and Samara, this, this is, I mean, when you get refugees, I mean, I'm, I'm working in this complex system of the Boulder Way Forward, which looks at, you know, homelessness or poverty. But then, you know, or or let's say a woman is experiencing domestic violence. Well, there's ties to worries about housing, worries about financing, worries about this and that, that all, uh, all come together. So Samara, when you have women come over, you're not just saying, here's a check for some money for one thing. I mean, there's so many, you know, things from housing to, to transportation to whatever, you know, what... Yeah. What, yeah, just any response to Liz, Liz, um, Liz's comments and uh, this topic in general? Yeah, sure. You know, so what one of the things when you were talking about the power and the, um, you know, I, we always, you know, I see the governor, you know, the government is the most ch challenging power structure for women nonprofit. It is very hard to receive, you know, and keep public funding. Uh, we sometimes we don't we majority the funding it has to be you have to help on the refugee. And our organization, unfortunately, we don't call not unfortunately, fortunately, <laughs> doesn't help on the refugee. We have asylum, DECA, undocumented people, immigrant as well. When they, yeah. we see a woman standing by the door needed help and that's what we do. But unfortunately we lost a lot of funding from the government. We recently actually, we lost uh, county wise employment assistance funding on a party line vote. Even though Women of the World, you know, we were the smallest organization was leading the way in terms of performance and data uh, uh, clarity, government power structure were more about cost cutting in visible ways uh, than understanding and supporting the value the program was creating. And, and it was really devastated is because we create this uh, EPP, we call it, um, employment partnership yeah, to yeah. do the partnership with the employer so we could get our women a job better job better pay better uh, uh, benefit and unfortunately it was taken away from us and even though we have a result a show is an amazing result for that and gave you know from changing the women uh, the job being you know to go to the uh, slick and get a certificate or give a scholarship, they uh, they um, start to be paid higher, uh, uh, um, you know, higher income, and thus uh, show in our data we you know we put two million dollars last year, yeah. two million dollars for the economy, mm -hmm. and we are not. We just recently become one million dollar uh, budget in our organization I, i'm so sorry much. i don't know if i answer your question no for no perfect perfect one of the things that's hard for me and i i think it's probably hard for both of you and you just talked about it is even though we have data to show certain things and we know from national and global data when you do certain things it 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 has you know bang for the buck longer term that will save funding, those shorter term budget kind of uh, things can be frustrating. 
Um, and I know all of us deal with that mm -hmm. um, because there's strategy for longer term um, that you need to set up things uh, for the short term. Uh, Liz, I see another question over for you specifically in the chat, actually. Uh, what are your suggestions on how to progress through fears? Back to the fears. Don't want to stay there the whole time. But this is a good question, particularly in executive leadership. And this person may, may be someone that's in a for-profit company. So I think some of those same things cross over no matter what organization we're in. Any thoughts about that, Liz? Yeah, definitely. I, I For me, I think it's probably a little bit different, but I think there's a lot of shared um, probably shared lessons, but for me, it's community building community. So, um, especially in executive leadership where I don't want to share specific fears all the time with my team that may also make them feel fearful, but I have a community of mostly women uh, around me, you know, um, that I can call on that. I see that I, um, spend time in community with, have lunch with, that I can process mm, sort of what yeah. I'm hearing. Because what happens is, for me, is that once I kind of name it, it loses some power. But also, then I just problem solve. I'm kind of an A personality. But, um, and and the, the, the folks that I process with, some people use therapy, some people have a mentor, help me see how to mitigate that fear. And so I often just move to bravery. Um, what, oh. as I work through the fear, because then I feel re-inspired, you know, I think about something I'm afraid of and then work through it. And then I feel re-inspired and, and um, ready, you know, more confident and ready to go and get it. And so that's what works for me. I also uh, have a breathing app that I try to use and, and, and just, oh. just kind of quiet my mind. Like I just try that's to do what I can. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't, I mean, I try to like eat breakfast and not be starving. I try to do those things, like get enough sleep because when I don't get enough sleep, I'm totally emotional. So I try to do those things that just really help me stay centered. Um, and I'm, and it's always, it's, I'm always trying. I'm never, I'm never as great as I want to be, <laughs> but, but you know, I think the older that I've gotten, I just, I actually say out loud sometimes good enough good enough. Mm -hmm. And so you, you get to a point, Samira was talking about, and women do this so much more than men over prepare, like do extra work. And, and sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes it may not be, but we, we are nervous, especially in masculine fields, that would be more, but sometimes you just have so much on the plate that you just say good enough. <laughs> I, love that. I actually say that out loud sometimes good enough especially when like I jump on and do a radio show or something like that and maybe I bumbled more I'm like good enough good enough you, you can't do anything about it you can't like I I know rumination too too well because I've studied it mm -hmm. and I'm like good enough and it helps me just move forward so I love you it know I, I'll add to that just briefly that I really actually like mantras as well and they oh. kind, kind of shifts day to day, but I have found myself saying recently, like this problem is small. The work is big. My life is big. My life is huge. Just so that I can take a step back and see that like the thing that is a crisis right now in my work and my life won't be in a year. Yeah. And I know that. And so sometimes I just say, this is small right now. My life is big. This work is big. Mm, I like that. Yeah. I was, I was taught by, um, a male, uh, mentor who, who was the president of UVU actually years ago. And he just said, nothing's as much of a crisis as everybody thinks. Like just sit on it for an hour or so, breathe. And I, I just tend to do that um, as well. So, so Samira, actually either one of you, um, there's another question coming in. Um, women, there's sometimes when women, and I don't know, I, I expect Samira, maybe in your paid work years ago, you, you confronted that, but maybe now, but who, who really want to be the only woman at the table, um, who are not necessarily supportive of other women. And we do deal with that from time to time, both, all of us are in women's, um, areas though. So that might be a little bit different. Uh, Samara or Liz, you know, any, um, you know, I, women do struggle with that at times. 
so you mean the woman they want to some women they want to judge to be the only one yes. yeah they want I, I I so I when I was uh, in uh, the semiconductor actually I was the only woman around men and when I heard they're gonna bring another woman from uh, another company to work with us and I thought oh my gosh yeah hey you know and <laughs> So a few of the technicians, they were working with me, you know, for me and everything. They said, why are you doing that? They're going to take your po position. They're going to get your pay. They can oh, do what wow. it's supposed to be. And I thought, whoa, 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 whoa. No, I'm encouraging every single woman to go to study, to be, you know, to be an engineer. You are a technician for many years. You need to think about it to be higher position so you be in that position that i'm in it you yeah. know i love that and i really wanted to share that and that's why sometimes my husband tell me why those as a woman why they are jealous from each other and the position and everything and you are not like that and i said yeah because that is not right you know i it mean it's a scarcity we, we, mentality yeah. yeah, and and the other thing so we always say is because of the man told us this way and whatever, then that we're not doing different if the woman she wants everything and she doesn't want to give you that chance. You know, so I think to be I, together. You know, I mean, and yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I I appreciate that so much because it sometimes it takes some conscious effort to to shift ourselves out of that scarcity mentality. That is scarcity mentality. In fact. When Ali Isom and Becky Edwards were both running, people would say to me all the time, like, why are there two women? That's going to take a vote from the other one. And I'm like, do you say that with men? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, there's two men in the race. Um, no, there's not yeah. just one spot for women or one spot for men. So yeah. um, I love that. Um, yeah, Liz, did you want to say any? I've got uh, other questions, too. Yeah. I would just echo um, really the spirit of Samara's response and just say that one way to shift it for me is to when someone is engages in a competitive way to deflate it by being really supportive. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that I don't know the details of this person's situation and, you know, there might be some impact that I can't see, but I'd say generally a Generally, a good deflation technique is to be supportive. I'm proud of you. Good going, girl. You know, whatever. Um, and just, just, just dive into the support. Don't, and that's, and then it's that's the growth mindset. Mm -hmm. Actually, when we when we start not wanting someone to be successful around us, that's absolutely our uh, fixed mindset. So we have to be intentional to keep ourselves in that um, that growth mindset. Um, let's see, there's, uh, various questions <laughs> coming in. Um, I'm, oh, wow. I just looked at our time too. Um, let me pick out one question. I want to get to a couple last questions. Um, our time is really gone. Um, are you seeing anything, Liz, that, that is intriguing for you to jump in? Um, well, there's a question about, in the chat, how do you navigate through career changes? How do you know it's time to take another opportunity? Oh, good so question. I've I've had a lot of career changes, as you heard from my bio. Um, and really, my life, my family comes first. Um, I, and I and I have always had to have a job to survive. Mm -hmm. So holding both of those, I just I I will leave a job when it is taking more than I'm giving. And oh. I always reflect on that. And in this role, I've reflected, is this job taking more from me in my life than I than I actually want to give it? Is it just burning me out? Um, and I and I often reflect on that. Like, where am I at? And, and, and how long do I have to sustain myself in a job that is so big and so hard? And how do I take care of myself? That's one question. But I'm always assessing how what that trade-off is yeah. and if it's the right trade-off for me. And I... That that is always why I've left, but I always have to have a plan to leave because I I need it I need the paycheck and so when I know I'm ready that this job isn't giving to me all that I um, need to sustain myself and it is taking so much more then I start to make an exit plan and look for other opportunities. Thank you for that. I think one thing to also 
I would add to that is sometimes we do the job certain ways and I'm, 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 I need to give this message to myself all the time. Sometimes, and, and we can sometimes, not in every job, but in some jobs, we can change the way we're doing the job and stay with that job, but say, I want to shift and I want to do things differently for ourselves if we have control over that, but take that to our, our um, and make suggestions to it. So I just, mm -hmm. I, I think there's some complexity there. Um, mm -hmm. Samara, I'm not sure if you've been over and looked at um, some of the um, other questions, but I'll ask you, if you have one, I've got one for you. Yeah. Um, the one I'd like to give you, is that okay if I choose? Yes, okay. sure. Mm -hmm. um, what are you most proud of in your career? Oh, that's a really good question. Yeah. <laughs> I'm proud of um, that I follow my dream. I yeah. follow my heart. Um, being a humanitarian. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people, when they used to say, when are you going to give up? I never did give up. is because my payment was a beautiful smile and thoughtful mm -hmm. prayer from the woman. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what make me going. So... I'm proud of changing the world to a better place and changing Utah to a better place because we are amazing by bringing people from, you know, being uh, back around to the a very harsh background with the uh, war, oppression, poverty, rape female genital mutilation, we bring them in here and we give them a better life to start from zero uh, and better life for their kids. I'm proud of what all that. Oh, that yeah. is so awesome. So I, I'm going to ask you, and, and, and if we have time after, um, we can jump over. There's some fabulous questions over there, but I always like to end by asking two questions. So one is, um, and Liz, I'll go to you first. Do you have a book or a training or an article or something that you recommend to other people and those listening in today? Um, so a book that has really, that I think could work for anyone, but it's a parenting book that has actually really helped me think about um, difficult conversations at work and, um, and the way that we care about people is called Good Inside by Becky Kennedy. And wow. it's just about starting from a place where everyone is good inside, but sometimes they're struggling with barriers. Sometimes they're struggling with other things, but they're good inside. Your kid is good inside. And I think about um, what she talks, she talks a lot about repair. And that has been really pivotal for me, not only as a parent, but at work where people come into our workplace and sometimes think that this is kind of a bubble where they won't experience sexism or racism or homophobia or transphobia. And they will, what we, because we're part of the world, but what we can do is be really good at repairing, addressing, confronting it and repair and repair. And so I've been thinking a lot about repair and that, mm -hmm. so the book is uh, Good Inside by Becky Kennedy. I love it. Thank you so much. Samira, what would you recommend? I think the crossroad of should and must is a wonderful book that forces us to looking into our heart for what we must do and take a stand against what we ever uh, what everyone says we should do. So I think my engineering training day in day in and day out, mm -hmm. review the data and creating solution should be a part of everyone's toolbox, a data driven approach uh, to the problem. Uh, in work and life uh, is a great training. The other things is I wanted to mention, you know, when I start Women of the World, you know, because I did not understand about the women when they are in the camp. So there is a really great book. It says, Re, uh, you know, Refugee Women. It talks oh. about how the refugee women in the camp be treated. It was really, really, you oh. know, it's really amazing and education for me. And there is another book that says, however, 
Long the Night, written by my friend Molly Milchin. She uh, helped million and million and million African women. She still uh, live in Africa. Uh, she helped a uh, million of uh, African women and girls to prevent the female genital cutting. Mm -hmm. So that is I needed for me to understand them so I could be a good leader, a good uh, person to those women when they come to her for help. I really appreciate that because sometimes we think we understand enough and sometimes that's all we can do. But if we have an opportunity to, we don't necessarily have empathy until we know more. Mm -hmm. right um and and so that's what you did is to go deeper and really understand those issues my my last question is um i always bring it back to a bolder way forward so the primary goal of a bolder way forward which is a seven year societal change movement is to ensure that more utah girls and women thrive in any setting so it can be the home and the workplace and the community um you know any of those. So what do you think are one or two of the most important things that need to be done in Utah to really do, excuse me, to do what we're talking about, to make sure that Utah girls and women thrive in any setting? Liz? Oh, um, you know, get it down to just one or two. I know you have a huge list, Liz. Um, well, there, yeah, there are so many. So these aren't the only two in no particular order. Um, childcare, I think um, definitely access to childcare for women who have to work um, or want to work. Um, obviously we have a big, I say obviously, cause I think we, many people realize we're, we're in a childcare crisis and we don't have public funding or support really to maintain childcare services uh, for our community. So definitely childcare because women are the primary uh, caregiver most often and the primary parent is, and um, most often the only parent when there is a single parent. And so, um, uh, and I know that this is really relevant um, probably all over the country, definitely in Salt Lake County and across the state of Utah, but housing, right? That like, oh yes, there, you know, there's the model of housing first that before we can worry about um, education, we need to have a safe home. Yeah. And uh, so access to good quality housing, low, uh, very affordable. The, the, and housing relates to safety and in many of the situations you're talking about with being housing people in domestic violence and all of those. So so they all, again, back to your earlier conversation, yeah. they're all connected. Yeah, it's also physical health, you know. Um, it's, Mental, yeah. Yeah, it's everything. Yeah, yeah I you. agree with Liz, actually, with both of them, you know, we are suffering from the child and, and, and the, you know, child care and the other things is the housing. Always we say affordable housing. And when you go in there, $1,500 for two bedrooms. So it's not affordable, really. Um, I will deeply, say deeply yeah. affordable. I've heard that term used more and more. Yeah. And, and so your yeah. women are probably down into that deeply affordable, yeah. all, all of the people you serve. Yeah, so I'll add with the for uh, with let's uh, say two of them, and I'll say support girls in the STEM. <laughs> my mm -hmm. STEM education allowed me to support my kids mm -hmm. and uh, as a professional and have the confidence in my leadership and decision making ability. You know, to start women of the world. So STEM, STEM, STEM. Well, oh, I I appreciate this so much. Uh, maybe just. 30 seconds, each of you, what would be your final thoughts, final advice for those listening in today? Uh, Samira, let's start with you on that. Sure. We must recognize and amplify the voices of forcibly displaced women worldwide, providing them with the guidance, resources, and support they need to rebuild their lives and their resilience, strength, and aspiration for better future demand our unwavering solidarity solidarity and action so please you see a woman walking in the street say hello to her be friend with her simple things really yeah and if someone wants to get involved and volunteer or be involved uh, what would you recommend just go to your website 
Please, yeah, website, you know, it has a volunteering, you know, to be mentor, to be friend with the women. When they be friend with the women, they are teaching her in English because a lot of times, you know, volunteer, they said, oh, I never da- taught English. And I said, no, you don't need to teach. You're speaking with this woman in English. And that she will pick it, that it will help. Hmm. Yeah. Please do, yeah, go to the um, women website. Women of the world, is it? Without the, actually, women of world.org. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Excellent. Thank you. And Liz, final thoughts. Oh, I would leave with just say, you know, support women, be intentional and thoughtful. I think we often talk about how Utah scores as, you know, in comparison in in relation to women's equity. But Utah, I mean, you, Samara, you, Dr. Madsen, there is full of so many women who are just hustling and working so hard. So there's this like vibrant community that's optimistic and that is really changing i think the future of utah and if you want to get involved as you said you can you can call up any of us i'm sure you could call up samara's you know at women of the world you can call up me there is a place for you and of course boulder way forward covers every spoke so (laughs) there's a place for you and i encourage you to find your place whatever that looks like however little however large that you can you can dedicate some time and energy to making a better future for generations for women and girls in our state, then I, I encourage you to do so. I love that because, you know, we, I always have people think about the head, heart and hands, what in, what mentally interests you, but where is your heart? Find that place. All of us need a place to do that. And just know that no matter if it's five or 10 minutes, we even, appreciate people forwarding our posts on social media. That's a little bit of service. I, you're probably like that too. There's a place for everybody. And um, within the Boulder Way Forward, we're, we're partnering with your two organizations as well as hundreds of others. So thank you so much for all of you, for you two speakers, Samira, Liz, thank you so much for joining me today and for all of you listening in today. Also thanking our sponsors one more time, especially the Utah Education Network. So have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.